Hi. I right, generally present in a different way. This is a new challenge for me. Let's see how it goes. OK. So before I start my presentation, I have to say I'm a practitioner. There are lots of experts in here, and I'm sure they are better than me and more precise in digging into history and accuracy in terms of history. history. My interest in digging into history is to become deep, to become deep, to hopefully find some solutions for some of the challenges that we are facing. So as you all know, and by now definitely you know, Tehran has gone through significant changes throughout the past 100 years. The general tendency of each building in Tehran to be demolished is between 10 to 20 years. So obviously, we are exposed to the danger of losing treasures. We are losing treasures as a result of some hasty decision making. Some of them happened during the Pahlavi period, and they are continuing to, to be happening these days during the Islamic Republic of Iran. But also, a city that is ever-changing presents us with an interesting opportunity that perhaps is worthy of noting. It presents us with the opportunity to adapt to the, pattern, the changing patterns of living that, especially these days, is quite fast. And it allows us to deal with emerging possibilities that are happening around us. So it's looking at a city like Tehran does remind me of a city like Tokyo. Not until a while ago, Tokyo was considered a chaotic city with no character. But architects like Arata Izazaki started arguing that the lack of character of Tokyo has become its character. And its ever-changing nature can be utilized in order to create a unique character. And I believe in the case of Tehran, this situation can be even further improved because we are dealing with a context where we have a thorough and deep, let's say, long history. And we do have the appreciation and nostalgia for our history. And at the same time, we have people who are burning to move forward. So my, the purpose of my presentation is to look from, to start analyzing, to start looking in a little bit more detail from late, uh, from late Qajar all the way until today and understand how did the cultural exchanges that some of us like, some of us hate, happened? How did they start? What were the influence of foreign architects? What were the influence of Iranian architects? who moved out of Iran and studied there, and then they all interacted with those who practiced in Iran that mo in most of the time triggered some major changes. And then we'll look into the patterns that these cultural exchanges repeat. And we see every time they somehow trigger some major changes in the architectural scene and discourse in Iran. So as you all know, until late Qajar, as Mr. Sagachi very eloquently mentioned um, the architecture of Iran gradually evolved. And we have some of the most interesting masterpieces up until that period. In my uh, opinion, Burj Erdia House is a fantastic example of um, evolution of central courtyard typology. But the notion of cultural exchange started to be introduced not until later in the Gajar period. The first building um, to, to use um, the changes or to be adapted to the change, changes was Shamsul Amare. It was the first building that used steel um, in its construction. It used the modified types of arch arches. However, the intervention remained limited to the facades of the building. This was further facilitated in early Reza uh, Pahlavi period where the relationship when uh, with the Germans were quite positive. So major constructions, roadworks, and railway developments happened. And also German engineers collaborated with Iranians to, to carry out these type of interventions. And also it was the same time 
that the Iranians who did study in Germany did come back to Iran and started practicing. So one of the important buildings which was built in 1927 was Iran Railway by Karim Taherzadeh Behzad. So I have created a comparison case for you here that this building directly resembles the Nazi building in Zeppelin Field by <coughs> an architect called Albert Speer. So this is what we call and what we refer to historically as European Romanticism. But European Romanticism later, a few years later, gradually changed to National Romanticism. As we all see in this building, the ancient Iran Museum by Andre Godard, which was built in 1935, was directly linked to the pre-Islamic period of Sasanid to the Targa Castro. And later, uh, apologies, earlier, this national romanticism started with some exaggerated building examples like Anushi Ravan High School by Nikolai Markov or Police Office Station by Ghalich Baghelian. Obviously, there's exaggerations in these buildings and the wrong timing of these buildings created criticisms against national uh, romanticism. So here we can see an example of Vartan Havanesian that interestingly says, a conscious mind shouts, we have to stop. Are we turning the city to the dead zoos and the chaotic zoo? How many lions, animals, and human figures do we need in our buildings? So this, in a way, triggered over the time, these type of radical criticisms triggered a gradual transition from exaggerated national romanticisms into a sim more simplified version. So we can see the first practice of that in the post office in Iran by Nicholas Markov, which some changes in the um, interventions of the motif, uh, motif shapes, the column changes, uh, among other changes, started to mark this gradual shift. So Havanesian was the one to move forward and introduce or build the first completely modern building in Iran called um, Art College of Girls. The use of technology was the heart of, at the heart of Iranian modernists, as well as the European modernists, or all the modernists across the world. Sakhtaman Plasko, or the Plasko building, owned by Habib al Ghanyan, was the first high rise which, with this exposed um, steel facade, and it was the second tall building in Iran which, has lift, which had lift in it. You can see, as we also, in other presentations as well, we have the Bank Melli, um, presented by Mohsen, or designed by Mohsen Furuqi, and in my opinion, a very interesting work, um, which is the Senate uh, by Mohsen Furuqi and Haydar Qiyai. Mohsen Furuqi, again, we're going back to the education and the notion of the cultural exchange. Mohsen Furuqi, and Andre Godard, which in my opinion represent very different ideologies, formed architectural education of Iran, creating a discourse. Andre Godard was the first head of Tehran School of Fine Art and continued to be a part of education of Iran for 30 years. The first group of graduates of Tehran Fine Art were 51 graduates, and the most well-known ones, as you all know, was Hu Shang Sehun. Hu Shang Sehun, now we see, as we saw earlier, with the, with the differences of Havan Sion and others at the time, the dichotomy of interest gradually started to become very obvious. But later on, this, this um, in my opinion, dichotomy of interest turned to parallel developments that were unstoppable in many ways. So Hu Shang Sehun, is one of those architects who, who worked in different fields and different, according to different briefs and according to different scenarios, worked on different types of projects. 
So one of, his, one of the angles that he worked on was the international modern style, like the Sepah Bank, an organic and integrated building with its nature, like the house in Ushan, and culturally rooted buildings. Uh, like his mausoleum, and like do you see in this example, Kamal al Mulk mausoleum in Neishabur. The work of Sehun is very interesting to me. His work understands geometry, technology, and culture. You are right, Dr. Madanipur. I'm one of those who have been trained under the educational system that does. Um, give a lot of values to math and understanding geometry as, as um, an element that can contribute not only to culture but also to structures and other elements of, of architecture. In one interview that um, in 2004, Moham, um, the, the Sehun had with Muhammad Reza, Muhammadi Parsa, he acknowledged the role of technology and he said one needs to pay attention to technology. In fact, it is the technology that drives architecture or has major influence in shaping the forms of the building. But this is even more interesting when we hear that from the work of someone who does have a lot of knowledge in creating culturally related objects in the choosing of its colors, the geometries that have cultural relationship and cultural connection to the past of Iran, and his work, in his work, we can see an obvious connection between the past and a kind of a bridge to the future by using and combining some of the older materials, some of the new materials, and utilizing geometry in a, in, in a smart way. And in this particular building, Hossein Amanat, which was again the con continuation of the same discourse as, as a student of um, Sehun, in my opinion, again, excel the same approach in this building. This building seam seamlessly synthesizes geometry, materiality, and technology to create an architecture that does respond to its culture, spaces, structure, as well as being very much a culturally linked building. So why is this building a forward-thinking building? If, if I go back, apologies. So you see, I've highlighted these two curves because of a certain reason. These are all familiar curves in your um, dictionary. But when you connect these two curves together, you form a surface that is curved. Apologies for getting too technical in here. But it creates a surface that is doubly curved from all the, the directions, which is a very effective form in terms of not only formal attraction, but also from its structural characteristic. This is what we call a hyperbolic paraboloid. So at the time, this was a close collaboration with the Arab engineers in here to establish a method and introduce a whole new typology to the architectural Iran, or architecture of Iran, which is very obviously culturally linked. Every single element of this building, every single stone is a different size. It's all of its elements are used for a certain purpose, not only architecturally, but also to create a connection. Abdul Aziz Farman Farmayan, Kamran Diba, and Nader Ardalan are also among architects that pushed the architecture in both directions in parallel, both in pushing modernism and at the same time creating projects that are culturally connected. So when we look at Kamran Diba's most famous work, which is Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, in the first glance, we see an immediate connection to the Bauhaus archive of Walter Gropius. As, so, as we mentioned, he is one of the pioneers of modern architecture. The, the plans of this building was produced 13 years prior to the building of this, um, this um, building. But when we look slightly closer, we see some of the major axes of this building are organized in a symmetrical manner. The materials are, are combined as a stone and concrete, in a, in a way a warm concrete. The proportions of these light wells are changed to resemble the, the, um, the water reservoirs and, and one-sided wind catchers. 
and turn them to light wells. So in a way, while creating visual and theoretical connection to the modernism, it has become more localized by taking some of the elements from the, the local architecture. This is another example of the work of a very obviously modern building which is adapted to the local culture. So no one can say this is not a modern building and no one can say this is not belonging to a certain part of the world, which in this case happens to be in Iran by choosing the colors, by choosing the arches in simplified arches. But with the Islamic revolution, things slowed down majorly. Lack of knowledge and lack of attention to historical buildings, especially to those that were built in the Pahlavi period, wars and economical crisis that it followed with, majorly slowed down architectural activities, which was followed for more than 20 years. So um, if within this period, Hadi Amir Miran, late Hadi Amir Miran, was one of the few very active architects in the field of Iran. He studied and practiced inside Iran. He was interested in the contemporary Iranian architecture, which was informed from its own culture and context. At, in his lecture in 1996 at the Architectural Association, he did say, I belong to a movement that aims to continue the evolution of architecture in this ancient land and to find its own place in the global context. His early work does remind me of the National Romanticism. It's, it's, uh, this is a Raf Saint John uh, sport complex, which resembles directly to a uh, to an ice house which is changed and turned in the direction to, um, to change the way that the ice houses worked to attract more sons and turn the functionality of it to a sport complex. But this was completely changed. Again, we see the patterns of cultural exchange repeating. One of the architects who happened to be one of the uh, pioneers of the folding architecture at, at, its, at its, its period moved back to Iran in 1994. They met and established a conversation and worked from 1994 to 1996. Even though the work of Bahram Shirdil is, stays on the paper, he had played a major part in forming the opinions of the architects that we see in Iran. So even Hadimir Miran mentioned, again in his lecture at the AA, I have been a practicing architect over the past 27 years, but only in the last few years, I expressed the opinions that I expressed today. So his work moved on to turn from directly referencing historical building to more of a subtle referencing of these type of uh, buildings, which was more informed from the qualities of the spaces. I was lucky enough to work with Hadi Mimra when I was 19 years old. And I do know when he was expressing the the, the, these buildings, he was expressing the qualities of the spaces, the lights, shadows, the uses of the water, and these elements. And how can we reproduce those feelings without repeating the same type of geometries? And over the past few years, the exchange of knowledge with Iran accelerated. This was partly due to the economical climate of the West and lots of architects, to name a few, Nashid Nabiyan, Farshid Mahzizadeh, Zubin Khabazi, Mehran Dawari, Human Talibi, amongst others, who were educated and practicing in the West, went back to Iran. And some even took the education and major architectural institutions back with them to Iran. Omid Kambari, who is actually with us today, took the AA um, school to Iran, even though a short school, a short course, we're hoping that it started a discourse and raised interest for some people to continue their education or create a, a discourse between different people who practice in different places. One of the other reasons, one of the other, one of the other um, reasons that let's say this um, cultural connection was, was emphasized in the beginning was a limitation. 
sanctions and isolations limited cultural activities with Iran in the first glance. We ourselves in Studio Integrate, we got planning permission for, for this building in Iran, which we started in 2009 and we carried on through a special committee and got planning permission for it, which was then later cancelled due to the sanctions and our bank account in here was uh, even closed down. I won't dig into this building but because it's not relevant to this topic, but we'll talk about it in future if you want. But at the same time, the same limitations increased the urge of knowing about the outside world and created a whole generation of media savvy people. So Professor Afshar Naderi very eloquently mentions the cultural movement's driving force is the determinations of Iran's most educated class to emerge from their shell to communicate with the outside world. For this reason, Iranians use any means available to send their message to the world. It is no coincidence that Persian is the fourth most used language on the internet. So the scale of intervention is within private houses these days on the facades of the buildings in a, in a dense urban settlement and public buildings. Again, we need to mention that most of these significant public buildings are commissioned under one mayor. So similar to the Pahlavi period, well, the Pahlavi Foundation was helping these type of commission to move forward, we are kind of experiencing the same type of period. And in each one of these scales, again, there are some architects who do establish a connection to the past, and there are some who are completely looking at architecture in a forward-thinking manner. So this, I put this example here by Puya Khazaili uh, Parsa, a villa in north of Iran. Its simple form, its elongated windows, does remind, me, does remind you of his fascination with the Corbusian modernism. However, its ascending geometry so the top creates a better view towards the Caspian Sea and at the same time an introverted courtyard and at their living space. At the same time, the raised volume allows the air to travel through the site and allowing for, for the building to be contextualized to its local climate. In my opinion, this building represents an interesting ad adaptation of the modernism to the local context and climate. And in the public buildings, you see uh, the work of Reza Danishmir, uh, FMA architects, that creates a 15,000 square meter cinema complex accommodating around 2,200 people. And it's the first internationally recognized work of architecture outside of Iran after a long period of time. Despite of not establishing any connection to, to the past, I think this building has its own merits. This building has direct connections between its functionality and its form. Its raised platform is formed because of the forms of the amphitheaters, and at the same time, the plaza connects the parks to the views of the mountain. Placing the circulations at the edge of the building allows the completely transparent facade without jeopardizing the functionality, and at the same time, creating panoramic raised views towards the park. And to wrap up, I would show the Tabiat Bridge by Leila, who um, she will take you through it with a lot more details. But this is also another example that it does have the contemporary looks, but with a closer connection to it in terms of patterns of its occupation and engaging with people does resonate with the way that we occupied our cultures and our buildings in the past. And the way and it's, we can we see with its success, I think it's the best testament of seeing how people are receiving these type of interventions. And to wrap up the conversations, I would like to go through quickly to, through what we went through. With, I want to mention that we saw a natural evolution of these two parallel views over the past 100 years. Both of these approaches, in my opinion, they are produce work of architecture that is worth, worthy of appreciation in some cases. However, the lack of knowledge and unnecessary tensions between tradition and modernity, we have lost significant treasures over the past 100 years. Hardline thinking and avoiding any cultural exchange to the Western world prevented progress for nearly more than 20 decades. 
two decades, sorry. And I'm hoping for the day that through careful curation and cultivating knowledge without prejudice, to be able to complement, to, to allow these two complementing disciplines to flourish in their natural courses of evolution, to hopefully again enable a city to form its own identity, the oldest cities of Iran to form their own identities that we all love. Thank you. <laughs>